Hello all. I'm just gonna wait until uh, a few of you are able to join us before we start talking about the uh, recent arrests of Fotis Dulos, Michelle Traconis, as well as Kent Mawinney. We'll get to that in one second. I'm just getting set up here. And also I'm going to share this on my Facebook page. Hi, Donna. Thanks for joining us this evening. All right. Hi, Albert. Hi, Jamie. Suzanne, thanks for joining us this evening. So here's the format, um, Wanda, thank you. Here's the format that we're gonna do right now. I, I don't, many of you had joined us when um, Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconos had been arrested before, um, back in June and September, and we had done a few of these Facebook Lives to kind of go over some of the details that you might not hear about in a shorter report or an article. Um, so I'm gonna go over some of the charges first, and then at some point we can take some questions. This is uh, Fotis Dulos's arrest warrant is about 35 pages. It's pretty chunky. It does detail, it goes into a lot of detail actually about um, some of the evidence that state police believe they have against Fotis Dulos. And Jamie, I know you're asking if there's any new information in here. There is some new information. We're getting more specifics on what state police, the evidence they think um, they have on Fotis Dulos as well as Michelle Traconis. And then kind of the bombshell yesterday was the arrest of this attorney, uh, Kent Mawinney which should be, is it an interesting element all, of all of this? Let me just read very, okay. So let's just talk about the charges real quick. Um, Fotis Dulos has been arrested and charged with felony murder, murder and kidnapping. He did not make bond today. His bond was set at $6 million. He was arrested yesterday at his home in Farmington. And um, then this morning he was arraigned in Stamford. Uh, a lot of people have been asking what's the difference between felony murder and murder because he got charged with both felony murder and murder. Uh, I was just talking with Jim Bergen, a criminal defense attorney in Hartford, who we often talk to um, about these kinds of cases. He has nothing to do with the FOTUS case. Uh, but felony murder is the murder in the course of a felony. So the felony in this would be a kidnapping charge that FOTUS is also getting tacked on here. So we have Vote is charged with felony murder, murder, and kidnapping. The kidnapping is in the first degree. Uh, kidnapping statute here in Connecticut means restraint with the intention of physical harm. So there's a few kind of ideas on, if it, people are saying, is it the zip ties that we're gonna talk about at some point? Could be, could be that just holding her um, with the intention of harming her could create a kidnapping charge. Uh, Michelle Traconis, Oh wait, back to Fotis for one quick second. So he did not make bond today. We had we had all heard at first, the intention was from his attorneys that he was going to make bond. So I know a lot of people went with, a lot of reporters went with the fact that he was going to make bond um, because there was some confusion there. His attorneys came out and said there was a little bit of something that happened that created a problem and they weren't able to bond him out today. They're expecting that he's gonna be able to bond out tomorrow. Once he bonds out, there are conditions of his bond, and some of the conditions are that he has to be under house arrest. Um, he, will, he would be placed under house arrest. Uh, he also got an order, a protective order against him, and that Dulos is not to have any contact with his children or his mother-in-law, Gloria Farber. Gloria Farber has his five kids right now in New York City at her apartment. He hasn't had any contact with them since he was first arrested in June, but now there's an official court order in place that he is not allowed to do that. Um, again, if Dulos does post bond, he'd be placed under house arrest. Uh, his attorney today in court asked if, I'm just looking at my notes because I want to be very specific, asked the judge if Dulos could leave the house for work if he's eventually, you know, makes his bond. The judge said it was okay on a case-by-case -case basis with prior approval, which is kind of how they were doing it before. Fotis Dulos was able to work and he had been arrested back in June uh, along with Michelle Traconis for hindering prosecution and tampering with evidence. And then they were both rearrested again in September for another charge 
of uh, tampering with evidence. So now this is the third time yesterday that they were arrested, but these are the most serious charges. These charges are no joke. I mean, felony murder, murder, and kidnapping for FOTUS. For Michelle Traconis, she got charged with a conspiracy to commit murder. Her bond was originally set at $2 million. Interestingly, today in court, her lawyers were trying to get it lower to half a million dollars bond, and the judge lowered it to 1.5 million. So it was originally set at two, then it got set to 1.5. Her lawyer claimed that she was gonna be able to post bond tomorrow. We will see about that. Uh, and then Kent Mawinney, let me pull this up right now. So again, Michelle Traconis got charged with conspiracy to commit murder. So not a murder charge there, conspiracy to commit. And then we have Kent Mawinney, who um, at one time was an attorney for Fotis Dulos on civil matters. He's also a close friend, and he got charged with conspiracy to commit murder. His bond was also set at $2 million. His lawyers in court today tried to argue to get it uh, broken down to $500,000 bond. The judge said no. He kept the bond, held the line at $2 million. Mawinney did not make bond this morning. Um, and so he remains in police custody tonight, all three of them do. Whether Mawinney makes bond tomorrow is unknown. Um, if he does, a condition of his bond would be that he would be put under house arrest. He would also have to have a GPS monitor on him. Uh, his next court date is for February 20th. So that's the latest. Any questions do you all have on the bond situation that I can try to um, answer about that? Again, they're all three are in custody tonight, um, so they did not make bond. We're going to see tomorrow. There's not going to be an actual any hearings, um, but they will have to appear in Stanford Superior Court if they're going to be able to bond out or not. And they've got to arrange that, see if they have you know enough um, cash backing or just collateral to be able to do that. Okay, so let's go through Fotis Dulos's. Um, what do you say? Did, it did not work, no, correct, Tina. It did not work for Kent. A judge said no. He said, no, we are not gonna lower your bond. Um, they weren't happy with him not turning himself in yesterday. Uh, you saw, it's interesting, because you saw Michelle Traconis's bond come down a little bit. Um, she, they say she's fully cooperating with the investigation, but Kent's bond set at two million. You know, he did not turn himself in yesterday. He was brought into custody by police and they were looking for him for a little while. Uh, so I'm sure that didn't make the judge uh, very happy. So, okay, Fotis Dulos' arrest warrant. There is stuff in here that is similar to the other arrest warrants. Uh, some of it is new. You're gonna hopefully bear with me because I'm gonna read it off. Um, and if anybody wants to follow along, this is also on our Hold on, sorry. Cynthia says, question, if arrested for capital murder, why is he, let me just read that again. Why is he getting out? So what's interesting about this is state police sent out a press release saying he was charged with capital murder. We were reporting that yesterday, but we actually, we don't have capital murder as a statute in Connecticut anymore because we don't have the death penalty anymore. So it's felony murder. Um, if, well, because here's the deal. I mean, he hasn't been convicted of these charges. And, you know, here in the United States, you are um, innocent until proven guilty. There are conditions where they release you. They judge on whether you're a flight risk or not. Uh, he is going to be monitored and he's under house arrest if he's released. So that's how our criminal justice system works. If he can make the bond, he might not be able to. It's a very high bond, $6 million, a lot of money. Okay, so we're going through FOTUS's arrest warrant here. Um, the charges are listed. Um, what they do is they kind of, they list who's gonna be named in this. And I'm gonna skip over some of this. Just to go over this, it says initial missing persons case. Friday, May 24th at seven o'clock PM. This is going back to the beginning, which we kind of already know, but for some background here. Uh, New Canaan Police Department received the initial report of a missing person identified as Jennifer Farber Dulos of 69 Wells Lane in New Canaan. Uh, New Canaan officers responded to the residence and they located suspected blood evidence on a Range Rover that was parked in the center garage bay. Jennifer was not located in the residence. New Canaan Police Investigation, investigation Division responded to the scene and located additional evidence indicative of a crime scene. 
Uh, New Canaan police contacted the Connecticut State Police for assistance and detectives from Troop G and the crime van responded to the scene. So this is usually what happens here. You have two agencies now working together, New Canaan local and state police. Uh, New Canaan police initiated a missing persons investigation, which determined the following. The residents on Wells Lane, this is where Jennifer lived in New Canaan, uh, included a three bay garage, the center of which contained this Range Rover. Um, the other bays were empty. While searches, searching and processing the garage, members of the crime van identified multiple areas within the garage, which presumptively tested positive for blood. Investigators observed spatter stains on the driver's side of the Range Rover and on the garage floor of the Range Rover. Uh, spatter stains are blood stains resulting from airborne blood drops created when external force is applied to liquid blood. Detectives also noted indications that the scene had been altered by an attempt to clean it up. Detectives determined a 2017 Chevrolet Suburban registered to Jennifer Dulos was missing from that res residential garage. The vehicle was found by New Canaan police, abandoned approximately 7 p.m. on Lampham Road, adjacent to the southwest portion of Waveney Park in New Canaan. Uh, the vehicle was unoccupied, its running lights were on, and its transmission was left in reverse. It's interesting. Uh, Jennifer was not found inside the vehicle or the surrounding area. Investigators found stain spatter on the passenger side of the vehicle. All right, so this is what they didn't get into as much in the last two arrest warrants. Here they go into forensic results from crime scene evidence, and they actually list what they have here. This is evidence recovered from the crime scene and whether it had Jennifer's DNA and if it had, um, if it tested positive at all for Fotis Dulos's DNA, for yeah. example. So this is from her New Canaan home. And I'm just reading this. This is from the state lab. They analyzed this. So evidence description, blood-like stain on the Land Rover hood, DNA match to Jennifer. Blood-like stain Land Rover bumper, DNA match to Jennifer. Blood-like stain Land Rover rear fender, DNA match to Jennifer Dulos. Blood-like stain from the kitchen sink faucet. Mixture of Jennifer and Fotis's DNA. This had come out before. Um, but they are again putting this in the arrest warrant, the, the sink. This is newer today. Swabbing inside knob slash plate of the mudroom door. So the, the door handle of the mudroom door has DNA matching Fotis Dulos's. Now his attorney has argued before that the transfer of DNA could be as easy as hugging someone or you know, according to Norm Pattis, his attorney, if he hugs one of his kids and the, the DNA is on his hands, um, both sides are going to have forensic experts come in and say whether that's, you know, possible or enough or whether it would test positive specifically for his DNA in that way. Um, or, if, sorry, if the transfer of DNA could happen in that way. Um, blood like stain on the garage door matched to Jennifer. Blood like stain on the east garage wall, DNA matched to Jennifer. All right, so also this kind of lists this out. Fotis Dulos and Associates. Detectives have identified the following persons as central to this investigation. Uh, today, Norm Pattis said fire department had been in the house before, I think. Catherine says that. I have not heard that. Um, it's pretty clear in the state police um, logs that the their nanny was the one who opened the door for New Canaan police and let them in. Uh, I have not heard anything about fire fires on the scene. Um, okay, so we know Fotis Dulos, we know Michelle Traconis, um, Paul Gumleni, keep saying his name wrong because I'm constantly like reading it, but not necessarily saying it out loud. He's a full-time employee of the four group. Work one second. Okay. Uh, Ken Mawini, practicing attorney and personal friend of Dulos, according to state police. And um, Andreas Tudz, Ziardis, I'm saying that wrong, childhood friend of Dulos who lives in Greece is also named in this. Hold on one second. We back? Okay. I told people to not text me when I was doing this, but then it makes my screen go blank. Okay. They list the vehicles. I'm not going to go through that right now. We kind of know what they are already. Um, We've already gone through the initial contact that state police had with Fotis Dulo. So I'm going to skip over that for right now. Um, police did get a search warrant for Fotis Dulos's cell phone, which we've talked about. Again, they're just rebringing back all of that. 
Uh, there's video from C4 cameras. There's all there's video cameras all over Hartford. Okay, that's how they like watch for crimes. There's shot spotters all over Hartford. So if you're gonna do something in Hartford. It's gonna be on camera. Uh, C4 surveillance video. They talk about that. Um, according to them, C4 located a male wearing a light colored shirt, dark pants, and ball cap. This individual was subsequently identified as Fotis Dulos. Uh, he was observed op operating a large black colored pickup truck with later identified as his Ford Raptor, and it was registered to the Ford group. A female passenger in that car on surveillance uh, identified as Dulos's girlfriend, Michelle Traconis. C4 mapped out Dulos's movements as he deposited multiple black colored plastic garbage bags into several trash receptacles during the evening of 524. That is the night that Jennifer Dulos went missing. And the mapping included the following points, and it goes through like 731 Albany Avenue. Uh, 732, traveling eastbound on Albany Avenue, and it keeps going through that. Now, Michelle Traconis later in this arrest warrant also says that they were there and um, that she was driving there. So they not only have them on camera, she identifies them as there, and both of their cell phones ping as they were there. Hold on, I'm reading. Um, Catherine, okay, Norm Pattis talked to him about being in the house court today. He mentioned it to the reporter. Let me look at that. Let me look at that a little bit later. Um, I got to watch most of the stuff today, but I need to look at that. Okay, here's more evidence. They listed out like this, and that wasn't in the previous arrest warrants. Okay, hold on, let me just read something real quick. So this is the evidence that they recovered from Albany Avenue in Hartford. So state police claim that Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis drove on Albany Avenue and deposited and threw out bags of evidence that had to do with the alleged crime scene. And so this is what they say found. It's, some of this is pretty telling. Now we already knew that cleaning supplies and specific things in the bag that tested positive for Jennifer's blood wound up um, on Albany Avenue. This lists them out. And it says whether the DNA matches Jennifer's, if it matches Fotis or Michelle Traconis's. Okay, so blood-like stain from a paper towel. This is all found again on either Albany Avenue or Blue Hills Avenue in Hartford. A blood-like stain from paper towel, DNA match to Jennifer Dulos. Sponge, DNA match to Jennifer Dulos. Mop handle, DNA match to Jennifer Dulos. Black garden glove. That is a match to Fotis Dulos on the interior. So they found a garden glove in Hartford. The inside of it matched Fotis Dulos. A black husky glove, DNA matched to Jennifer Dulos on the exterior. That's a separate glove. Vineyard vine striped shirt, DNA matched to Jennifer Dulos. We had talked about that before. Um, a bra was found, DNA matched to Jennifer Dulos. A clear poncho without a hood, Jennifer Dulos. Clear poncho with a hood, Jennifer Dulos. Four zip ties, DNA match to Jennifer Dulos. Standard textile brand bath towel, DNA match to Jennifer Dulos. Two plastic garbage bags taped together with tape. Sorry, pl two plastic garbage bags taped together with black tape. DNA match to both Jennifer Dulos and Michelle Traconis. One plastic bag with black tape, DNA match to Jennifer Dulos. Four pieces of black bag with duct tape right index fingerprint of Fotis Dulos. Okay, let's pause on that one for a second. Pieces of a black bag with duct tape. So on the duct tape, they found his fingerprint, not just DNA. Okay. Um, a torn plastic garbage bag tied to a knot on one side with red brown stains and black tape attached to inside of a bag. Right middle fingerprint of Fotis Dulos left middle fingerprint of Fotis Dulos. Swabbing of the bag, interior of knot on that bag. Match to Jennifer Dulos. Blood-like stain on Pacho, DNA match to Jennifer Dulos. Swabbing from trash bag, DNA match to Jennifer Dulos. Swabbing from tangle of black tape, DNA match to Jennifer Dulos. Blood-like stain from an exterior of non-damaged plastic bag, DNA match to Jennifer Dulos. Swabbing of sticky side duct tape located on the interior bag, DNA match to Jennifer Dulos. And this last one is definitely new information. This bag, um, this garbage bag, when they swabbed the bag opening and the separate bag portion, DNA match to Jennifer Dulos, 
Fotis Dulos, Michelle Traconis. So they have this bag. Well, they have, you know, evidence with all of them on there, but this bag specifically has all three of their DNA matches. So this is from kind of before too, but they listed again um, the recovery of the altered license plates on Albany Avenue. C4 surveillance showed Dulos allegedly placing a large white colored item into a storm drain at the intersection of Albany Avenue and Adams Street. Uh, detectives uh, responded to the intersection and accessed the drain. A large white colored FedEx envelope was removed from the drain and it was secured by detectives. That envelope found to contain two Connecticut passenger plates, which initially appeared with the read. I don't need to give you guys the read on that. Um, upon closer inspection though, detectives discovered the plate had been altered using what appeared to be blue tape and clear adhesive. And so someone had tampered with this license plate. When detectives determined the actual plate number, uh, the plate was listed as canceled, but was registered to Fotis Dulos. Okay, that part was old, we knew that. So we know that the first arrest happened because of the ba based on the C4 cameras in Hartford and the evidence that they had found, they were able to um, arrest them on that. And it kind of goes through that. Goes through the initial interview with Michelle Traconis. Okay, so I know you've probably read about, if you've been following this case closely, these, these alibi scripts that appeared um, that state police continue to go over. I'll read you a little bit of that in case you know you're wondering. Uh, Traconis's explanation of alibi scripts. This was on uh, June 3rd. And again, this is still stuff we kind of knew before, but the day after Traconis's first interview, crime van detectives were executing a search warrant at Fort Jefferson Crossing, which is in Farmington, when they located a set of handwritten notes. These documents came to be referred to invest by investigators as the alibi script. The two-page document included two distinct handwriting styles, which were later confirmed by Traconis to be her own handwriting and that of Dulos. The alibi script was an outline of the activities of Traconis and Dulos for the dates of 524, that's the day Jennifer went missing, and 525. Um, and it laid out in approximately hour increments what happened that day. The original handwritten alibi scripts were recovered from a trash bin in the four group office and photocopies of it were in a briefcase. The alibi script included a narrative which was nearly identical to the information provided by Traconis in her first interview to state police. And it represented an account again of what happened on 524 and 525, which Dulos and Traconis together had authored, according to state police, in which narrative Traconis presented nearly verbatim in her first interview. In her second two interviews, Traconis's account of those dates diverged from the alibi script, particularly when confronted with evidence, much of which was unknown to investigators during her first interview. It is therefore important to describe the various sources of information developed thus far during the investigation. Okay, so they're gonna go through and they're gonna talk about contradictions in some of the interviews that she saw. Um, which has been detailed in the past, you know, including going over to the car wash, Russell Speeder's car wash and Avon. And, um, let me just go through this. So this is still Fotis Dulos's arrest warrant. It's just, they're gonna use information from Traconis's interviews. Okay, this is interesting, Dulos's whereabouts. During her three interviews, Traconis provided a variety of explanations when asked if Dulos was home at Fort Jefferson Crossing in Farmington when she awoke on the morning of 524. Keep in mind, Jennifer Dulos was last seen on 524. She was dropping her kids off at school at 8 a.m. Um, that was the last, last time anyone saw her and police believe the crime was committed sometime um, possibly in the morning hours after that. So the explanations for 520. Okay, hold on. Interview one. She claims that both she and Dulos had woken up at their residence at 6.40. She told investigators that she and Dulos had showered and were intimate together before she made breakfast for her daughter and then drove to school. Note, this is inconsistent with information from the forensic download of Dulos's cell phone, which indicated that on 5.24, the alarm activated at 4.20 a.m. and was shut off at 4.21. When pressed on whether Dulos was home that morning, Traconis admitted, so maybe he, Dulos, wasn't home the entire morning. But Traconis continued to still provide Dulos with an alibi for that morning from 6.40 until 8.15 a.m. 
She reported last seeing Dulos that morning at 8.15 in the four group office with Mawinney, Kent Mawinney, the attorney who had just got arrested yesterday. Draconis explained that she was out of the house from 9 a.m. to 11.30, which provides her with plausible deniability for that time period. When asked to clarify if Dulos was home the morning of 524, Draconis did not answer the question. Instead, she immediately began telling investigators that she, what she had been doing by saying, all my morning I have been doing, he was in the house, I have texts. Detectives continued to ask about Dulos' whereabouts and Draconis ultimately acknowledged, so maybe he wasn't home. Second interview. From the very beginning of the second interview, Draconis continued to lie about seeing Dulos on the morning of 524. Keep in mind, guys, when I'm reading this, this is state police's point of view. If they're trying to get across. This is the evidence that they say they collected. Um, you know, and a jury court is going to decide whether uh, these people did these crimes or not as I read this. OK, so Traconis was asked if Dulos was at the home when she woke up at 640. This is the second interview. Traconis first reported he was there when I woke up. He was in the house when Traconis was told Investigators had evidence showing Dulos was not in the house. Draconis replied, okay. Draconis proceeded to cover her face with her hands, wipe her eyes, and then tried to change the subject. Draconis's attorney, Andrew Bowman, tried to clarify that Draconis to see if she actually saw Dulos on the morning of 524. Draconis hedged her answer, but acquiesced that she did not see Dulos on that day between 1 p.m. and 2. Draconis was asked if there was tension between Tulos and herself because of his divorce and the problems surrounding it. Her response was, we fight all the time. Detectives asked Draconis if the turmoil might be a motivating factor to get rid of Jennifer. Draconis reported that Dulos had expressed to her that he never thought Jennifer would do this to him and that he never saw, quote, this side of her. Draconis also conveyed Dulos had told her, quote, sometimes I hope she disappears. So Traconis is saying that Dulos told her, sometimes I hope she disappears. Okay. Third interview. Traconis statements include, investigators said Traconis, if she is ready, sorry, investigators asked Traconis if she is ready to admit that she is not being 100% truthful with investigators during her first two interviews. Traconis hesitated before answering yes. Investigators asked Traconis if Dulos was home when she shut off her alarm on 524 at 640 a.m. Traconis began shaking her head left to right and responded, no. Detectives confirmed, was he not there? Traconis said, no. Investigators asked Traconis if she showered that morning with Dulos. Traconis responded, no, I didn't. Traconis ultimately admitted that she had not seen Dulos in the bedroom, in the shower, or anywhere else in the house that morning until noontime when Dulos called her up for lunch. Traconis told investigators at her first interview, um, in her first interview, that there was a four group meeting the morning of 524 at Jefferson Crossing, and that was attended by Dulos and Kent Mawinney, the attorney. Traconis's account was contradicted by her subsequent claims by Mawinney. <clears throat> so during the initial interview, Traconis claimed that Dulos was in the four group office conducted a business meeting with the attorney, Kent Mawinney, on the morning of 524 around 8.15 a.m. She ultimately told three different versions of this meeting. Traconis said that she saw Mawinney and Dulos both sitting at a table talking with one another. Later, Traconis indicated she only heard Mawinney and Dulos talking but never saw the two together sitting at the table. And then finally, Traconis reported she only heard Mawinney talking but did not see or hear Fotis Dulos. Traconis stated that she greeted Mawinney in the four group office that morning. In an interview, Mawinney admitted to investigators he was at the four group office that morning, but stated that he never saw Traconis. So stories are changing here and they're both saying different things. Uh, again, in the second interview, Traconis' statements included that Traconis was asked if Mawinney was in the four group office, to which she began nodding her head and said, yes, that I did see. She stated Mawinney had a meeting that morning with Dulos. She continued to maintain that Dulos was present in the office about 8.20 or 8.30. Traconis added that she had greeted Mawinney by saying hi. When Traconis asked if she knew where Dulos' cell phone was that morning, she replied that she thought Dulos had his cell phone. When asked if Dulos would normally carry his cell phone with him, Traconis, res Traconis responded yes and no, but a lot yes. Traconis asked that it would be unusual for Dulos to be without his phone for even a few hours. Traconis left 
opened the possibility that Dulos had left the cell phone behind accidentally, but when questioned, Draconis reported Dulos had not told her that he forgot his cell phone. Okay, let me just read through. Good morning. Okay, so it goes back and forth about what we're hearing during the different interviews. Was Mawini there? Was he not there? Uh, was Fotis there? But the conclusion is that under repeated questioning by detectives, Draconis was unwilling to say that Dulos was not at the residence. This is later in the morning from what we were talking about before. She would only say that she did not see Dulos during the morning, not in the bedroom, not in the kitchen, not in the four group office, and that she did not know his whereabouts during the entire morning. Having seen his phone on his desk, Draconis reported that she assumed Dulos was at the residence. I thought Dulos was there because Kent was there, but I didn't see Dulos, I didn't see him, Draconis later had added. But then I always thought that he, Dulos, was in the house, but thinking I never saw him. I never heard his voice, so obviously he wasn't, or probably he wasn't in the house. So she's saying, even despite her first interview, when she says that they took a shower together and all this stuff, now she's saying, I actually, I never saw him, and I saw his phone on his desk, so I guess I just assumed that he was there, but I guess I never saw him. But I, I definitely saw Kent Mawinney, the lawyer there, is what she's saying. All right, this also details an incoming phone call. This says an incoming phone call from... Um, Fotis's friend from Greece, Andreas Tutziardidis. I'm saying that wrong. It's a Greek name. I'm sorry. Can't. I, I got. I gotta have a pronunciation. If anyone has it for me, let me know. I did. I did do my term abroad in Greece. I lived there for several months. Um, but I'm gonna need some help on that one. All right. So Dulos's phone records showed an incoming call from a cell phone on 524. According to state police, they believe that this call was prearranged by Dulos the previous day with his friend who lives in Greece. Um, so the incoming call from his friend was not mentioned by Traconis during the first interview. During the second interview, she did not discuss the call from Greece during this interview. She continued to claim that she had no knowledge that Dulos did not have his cell phone that day. And in the third interview, Traconis changed her story entirely regarding the presence slash absence of Dulos' cell phone that day by acknowledging uh, that Dulos' cell phone was sitting on the four group office as she and Kent Mawinney stood in the office and that it received an incoming call on that date. The phone rang and it was a call, well, it was a call from Andreas and Kent stood up. This is what Michelle Traconis is saying. According to, to Traconis, Mawinney motioned for her to answer the cell phone. In answering a question from attorney Bowman, Traconis responded, he, Mawinney, said, like, there's a phone ringing. Are you gonna do something with the phone or the call? And I picked up the phone. Traconis stated she knew that Andreas, a childhood friend of Dulos who lives in Greece, but that she was not sure if it was him calling. Traconis also indicated that she heard static when she answered the cell phone and it was difficult to hear. Traconis reported that she had heard the Greek word for hello and she responded, Ola, the Spanish word for hello. Draconis explained that the call was short and lasted only a few seconds before ending. Dulos's cell phone data shows a 17 second phone call here. Draconis stated, I'm pretty sure it was Andreas's voice. Draconis indicated there was no follow up phone call and that soon after the call, she left the office leaving Dulos's cell phone sitting on the table, rearranged, or that phone call was prearranged from the day before. Then they go into um, Draconis's alibis for the morning, which we've kind of already gone through. Uh, Traconis has lunch with Fotis Dulos, allegedly, but Traconis was inconsistent when questioned about Dulos' arrival at the home of Jefferson Crossing and their lunch together. So it kind of goes through the time frame here uh, with the three different interviews here and what the alibi scripts say, different things from that day. Again, in the third interview, Traconis admitted she could not account for Dulos's whereabouts in the morning of 524. We knew that from what I had read, we just read. So 80 Mountain Spring Road, which is the property that the four group owes, um, it's a big, big house there, property owned by the four group. It includes, a it's basically a mansion with five bedrooms, five full and three and a half baths five acre lot there up on the mountain. Uh, Traconis provided vastly different accounts, all of which conflicted with location data gleaned from Dulos and Traconis's cell phone. So police are using cell phones to see if this, um, <clears throat> if this matches up or not. 
Traconis reported that Dulos called her on the phone to tell her that both, this is the initial interview, both had to go over to 80 Mountain Spring Road to clean up the house in preparation for a client meeting the next morning. She described it as common for them to use their cell phones to call one another. Traconis had to bring a vacuum, a Swiffer mopper, uh, paper towels, Clorox spray, garbage bags. Traconis reported they drove to 80 Mountain Spring Road in separate vehicles. And uh, soon after arriving, Traconis reported she discovered the vacuum she had brought did not work. She explained she had to return, how she returned to Jefferson Crossing and obtained a small broom. broom. In order to clarify her story, detectives asked Traconis if she, what she first saw when she drove in the driveway. She reported seeing a suburban already parked in, with Dulo standing there in the garage. Okay, this is kind of stuff we knew. I'm just going to scan this. This is about when they go and they go to Mountain Spring, the Mountain Spring Road, what the timeline was during the day that Jennifer Dulos went missing. State police are basically saying that there's inconsistencies in her stories from the different interviews. Then they're going to go through um, the whole Albany Avenue, what they did that night, Russell Speeder's car wash, which we've talked about before. Again, you can read all this specifically on our website, but I want to get to some of the uh, newer stuff as well. They have a ton of surveillance video from Mountain Spring Road when they're going back and forth. Uh, surveillance radio on Eli Road, that's all in the mountain. Beautiful area up in uh, Farmington and Avon. Then they go through all the surveillance video that they have from New Canaan uh, in terms of cars going back and forth with that Toyota. Okay. Ken Mawinney is now a section in this. So this is new information here. Ken Mawinney is a close friend of Dulos and a practicing attorney who lives in South Windsor. His law practice is based in Bloomfield. Mawinney's name appeared on the alibi scripts written by Dulos and Traconis and was identified by Traconis during all three interviews, as we just talked about, as a person present in the four group office on the morning of 524. Uh, for a meeting with Dulos. Mawini was interviewed on June 9th and then again on the 25th by detectives. So he got interviewed twice. To obtain his personal knowledge of the events which transpired in the four group office located above the garage of the Dulos's residence. And specifically what contact he might have had between Dulos, Traconis, or any other persons that day of Jennifer's disappearance, May 24th. Mawini's statements include that Mawini stated he met Michelle for the first time within the last within the last 30 days of this meeting at Jefferson Crossing. Mawini was aware that Fotis had been dating Michelle prior to his meeting her for the first time. Mawini stated he had no scheduled meeting with Dulos on the morning of 524 and he acknowledged he did not see Dulos that morning. Okay, so now he's saying he didn't see Dulos. So Michelle and Mawini have not seen Dulos that morning. In his second interview, Mawini changed his account from May 24th to reflect that there was a prearranged meeting with Dulos that morning. Mawini continued to maintain he did not see Dulos that morning. Mawini indicated he arrived around 7.40 in the morning where he remained for about 40 to 50 minutes before leaving. When asked if he had contact with Dulos on 5.23, the day before Jennifer's disappearance, uh, Mawini claimed he could not remember. Dulos's phone records showed an outgoing call to Mawini on 5.23 at 5.30 in the evening. Mawini denied any phone call contact with Dulos on May 24th, the day Jennifer went missing. Fotis's phone records, though, documented an outgoing call to Mawinney on 524 at 7.47 p.m. That's around the time that he was allegedly over Albany Avenue in Hartford. During his second interview with police, Mawinney reported that he received a concussion resulting from a fall down a set of stairs on 525, the day after Jennifer's disappearance. Uh, Mawinney reported that he had to replace his cell phone after the fall damaged the phone screen. Mawinney reported he still had no memory of seeing Dulos or Traconis on May 24th. Mawinney reported he could not remember any incoming phone call on 524 at 8.26 a.m. When pressed on whether he answered any calls that morning, Mawinney responded, why would I direct someone to answer a phone? Detectives had to explain to Mawinney that was not answering the question being asked several times. In her, in her third interview, Traconis did assert that Mawinney had directed her to answer the call. That was the call coming in from Greece on the cell phone, which was lying on the desk at the four group office. In his first interview, Mawinney had denied having any contact whatsoever with Dulos in 524. In his second interview, prior to any questioning by detectives on the topic, Mawinney stated, I don't remember having contact with Dulos. If there's a phone call, I guess I did, but I don't remember having contact with him. 
Uh, Mawini was asked if he would know why Dulos would have contacted him while dumping evidence into trash receptacles in Hartford, Connecticut. Mawini reiterated that he did not remember any kind of contact with Dulos and did not know why Fotis would call him while he was disposing of evidence. Then they talk about um, Paul Gemeni, who was the project manager with the four group, and there was issues that day where uh, Fotis Dulos had taken his vehicle and he thought it was strange. Seats came out of the car. It was a whole thing. Police alleged that Fotis Dulos took that vehicle, the truck, drove it down to New Canaan, committed the crime, drove it back up, and then tried to hand the truck back over after cleaning it at Russell Speedway's car, Russell's car, Speedway. Um, give me one second, guys. Hold on. Hey, Spencer. Jason just emailed me the super tease. Um, thank you. Okay. So, sorry guys, we're still planning our coverage for this evening. So I'm going to skip over that part because we knew that in the former arrest warrants. Okay, here's something interesting too. They interviewed this woman, Lauren, um, who is the longtime child care employee hired by Jennifer starting in May of 2013. She's, she's the longtime nanny for the family who worked with the five Dulos children. Um, worked closely with Jennifer Dulos until the day of her disappearance. So on the May 21st, she was working at Jennifer's home in New Canaan and was stacking, I guess, children's equipment on shelves there. And I don't know why they added that in, but May 22nd, she was at the, oh, she's just talking about how often she was there. Okay, so she was there on Tuesday, May 21st, before Jennifer went missing. She was there on the 22nd, preparing for a supervised visit, which was scheduled to start at 4.30 p.m., 30 minutes prior to Dulos' scheduled arrival. Jennifer ran down the stairs saying that Dulos had already arrived. By the time Jennifer contacted Dulos, he had driven all the way up the driveway and was near the garage bays. Uh, he claimed that he was confused about the time of the visit, despite the routine time of 4.30 to 7.30 p.m. being established and confirmed by Dulos well in advance. Dulos was also aware he was not to enter the property prior to the arrival of uh, this person who's a third party observer. So he's not allowed, you know, these are the conditions of the divorce. He has to, he's not allowed to enter the property without this third party. The plan for the 522 visitation was for Dulos to take the kids to the Grace Farms, to Grace Farms in New Canaan for a picnic. Dulos suddenly realized that Grace Farms closed at 6 p.m. and gained Jennifer's permission to return to 69 Wells Lane, her house to picnic with the children outside of the house in the rear yard. Jennifer's agreement was partially attributable to the fact that a third party observer uh, would be at the home monitoring Dulos at all times. So he tries to go, this is a couple days before she goes missing, he tries to take the kids, he wants to take the kids somewhere, realize it's closed, ask if he can do it in the backyard. And Jennifer gives him permission because there is a third party observer who's sitting with them and doing this. Jennifer and um, Lauren, who's her longtime nanny, took steps to ensure Dulos did not enter the residence as Jennifer was strictly opposed to Dulos ever entering the home. They placed the food out on the rear patio table and locked the rear mudroom door to prevent Dulos from entering the kitchen. Keep in mind, guys, they're setting this up because Fotis's DNA was found on the faucet. So what police are saying, according to the nanny, you know, Norm was saying, well, he could have gone in the house. I think actually previously he said he might have. Um, don't take that piece of information and ingrain it because I gotta, I gotta confirm that. But when I'm thinking back, uh, he, he might, Norm Pattis might have said that he had gone in the house before. According to the nanny though, Fotis Dulos wasn't in the house. On 523, this is the day before Jennifer Dulos went missing. Jennifer discussed the possibility of the nanny staying overnight on Wells Lane as Jennifer had an early doctor's appointment in the city the next morning. Jennifer ultimately decided she would stay in New Cane and bring the children to school, leave for the appointment. She told the nanny it would not be necessary for her to stay that night. Jennifer also told the nanny she was planning on taking the Range Rover to the city because it was smaller and easier to park than the Suburban. Yes. So 524, the day Jennifer goes missing, the nanny arrives at 11.30 a.m. As usual, she opened the center bay garage door via the keypad and immediately noticed the Range Rover was still parked in the garage while the Suburban was gone. Was gone. Upon entering the kitchen, she noticed Jennifer's handbag was on the floor in the doorway between the mudroom and the kitchen, and she found Jennifer's unopened granola bar and a mug of tea on the kitchen counter. As she washed Jennifer's mug, 
Lauren noticed the paper towel near the sink needed replacement. She went to the pantry for a new roll and found two fresh rolls were left. Lauren found this incredibly strange, that's a quote, because just the night before she had placed a brand new pack of 12 rolls, 12 rolls in that pantry. Lauren wrote, I sat there and wondered what had happened last night that they had used 10 rolls of paper towels. So after picking up the four children, as the fifth went directly to a friend's home, uh, the nanny returned to Wells Lane and fed the children. At 12.43 p.m., she sent a text message to Jennifer, which went unanswered. As she and the children prepared to leave the home, she noticed the rear mudroom door, which led to the outside, was unlocked. The store was routinely locked unless the children were playing in the backyard. After locking the store, she sent another text to Jennifer at 1.10, which is when she should have been arriving in New York City with the children at 2.30. So, okay, this uh, message also went unanswered. Upon arrival at the apartment of Jennifer's mother, Gloria Farber, Lauren sent another text to Jennifer announcing their arrival, which gleaned no response. Okay, so the nanny's taking the kids to New York. She's still texting Jennifer like, where are you? She's getting no response. At 4 p.m., a call to Jennifer's cell phone went straight to voicemail. Lauren wrote, immediately my stomach sank and I had a feeling that something was wrong. In almost seven years that I have worked for Jennifer, I never ever had a hard time reaching her and never had an issue with her phone being off. After discovering Jennifer never showed for the children's orthodontist appointment at 4.40, uh, Lauren's reaction was, my first thought was that Fotis did something. After pondering other possible scenarios, Miss uh, uh, Lauren, the nanny, arrived back at the feeling that something happened and that Fotis was most likely involved. This is just what her gut feeling is saying. At this point, this is again in, this, in the arrest warrant for Fotis Dulos. At this point, she contacted Gloria Farber, who's Jennifer's mother, and checked with other close friends and relatives of Jennifer who had not heard from her. After returning to Gloria Farber's apartment, they're in New York at this point, um, the nanny, as well as a close friend, contacted New Canaan police telling them that she was missing, that she was going through a divorce with a man that had threatened her in the past and owns a gun. After confirming with New Canaan police they had spoken with Dulos and it was all right to accept his incoming calls, Lauren called Dulos at 8.41 p.m. on the night that Jennifer went missing. Lauren explained that during the call, Fotis never asked me how Jennifer was doing the day previously or when I had last heard from her or showed any kind of concern about the fact that Jennifer was missing. Fotis did ask how the kids were doing and asked if I had all the kids at Gloria's apartment. He went on to remind her that he had a visitation with the kids at 11 a.m. Saturday morning and that I must bring them for a visit. He told me that I needed to make sure I woke up early enough to leave New York City and that I'm not late. After agreeing to Dulos request Duly, re, agreeing to Dulos's request, Dulos told her that the kids really needed him right now, that this visitation still needed to happen. So in 525, this is the day after Jennifer went missing, Dulos texted the nanny, sorry, his first text to the nanny arrived at 539 in the morning, the day after Jennifer went missing. Good morning, Lauren. Any news? Miss Almeida replied, that's the nanny. There was no news. Throughout the day, Dulos called the nanny and texted her asking about the children, asking if there was any news, attempts to verify that Lauren was bringing the children for visitation. Two days after, this is uh, May 26 now, Dulos continued to text her about the status of the children and whether they were all together in New York. At noon, Dulos showed up unannounced at Gloria Farber's Manhattan apartment and demanded entry. The doorman had already been instructed to prevent Dulos from entering the building due to ongoing family court issues and the fact that Dulos was unwelcome at Gloria Farber's residence. New York City police responded to the scene and were told by Dulos that his children had been abducted and that he was demanding to see them. New Canaan police officers spoke with New York City officers and confirmed that Dulos was prohibited by court order from visiting his children unsupervised. Okay, so. He's trying to see his kids. He wants to pick up his kids in New Canaan. According to the divorce settlement that was going on, he there always had to be a third party there if he did that. And so New York City police, when he said that his kids were abducted, called New Canaan police and they confirmed that he needed this other person there. He wasn't allowed to see his kids without this. He couldn't see them unsupervised. 
Dulos was told to leave the property and ultimately comply. Jennifer's friend, Carrie Luff, this is the uh, woman who we get statements from um, with reaction to you know these arrests. She's been the family spokesperson, filed a domestic violence report regarding the incident with NYPD. So 527, May 27th, 531, Dulos texts the nanny again to check on the children. Following her reply that the children were fine, Dulos texted, thanks for your response. Please send me updates every three hours. I do not want to feel that I am pestering you, but please understand that I am the father. I am extremely concerned about with the situation. Dulos did not ask anything about Jennifer and Lauren provided him with no response. During this investigation, the nanny was shown photographs of the South Garage Bay taken by the crime van processing, crime scene van processing. As she was familiar with the arrangement of items, having set them up there in place herself many times, Lauren was asked if she noted any changes. She reported that two white camping pillows were missing from the shelves. These camping pillows were never touched and were used only twice by the kids during a school trip. She had noticed the pillows within the past two months while searching for an old towel to use for an activity with the kids. In another photograph, the nanny noticed a cleaning supply bucket was missing from the shelving. The bucket had been either red or white and it contained cleaning supplies used by the housekeeper. The nanny had placed the bucket on the shelf on 521 as she cleaned the garage for Jennifer. Okay. There's a few other people here that they're talking about, which I'll go, it's numb. I'm gonna skip over here. Goes over information provided about the sharing agreement pertaining to apparent financial strain of Fotis Dulos. Trying to establish a motive for him to commit a murder. Um, a portion of which they say is summarized below. It's noteworthy that Dulos is currently involved in an ongoing civil suit, which we've been covering, uh, against him by Gloria Farber, the mother of Jennifer Farber Dulos, which is $2.5 million. Uh, the suit, it's, it, that's the amount of money that's in dispute. The suit was started in 2018 and Dulos was aware of the potential financial exposure at the time of Jennifer's disappearance. Let's wait guys one second. Okay. Okay, sorry, I'm back. Dulos's lending portfolio currently consists of several loan accounts. Uh, multiple lines of credit have a current balance due as of 531 of approximately uh, $4 million, almost $5 million here, guys. $4 million, yep, almost $5 million. There's also numerous mortgages held against his construction properties. Of note is the Savings Bank of Danbury line of credit opened by Dulos under the name of his company, Four Group, in March of 2018. The line of credit has a maximum draw of approximately $2.7 million, which was extended as of May 2019 with a balance due of approximately $2.6 million. It appears uh, beginning approximately in April 1st of 2018 through May 31st of 2019 that Dulos began funding the four group business checking account held at People's United Bank with advances from the line of credit totaling about $1.6 million. Also during this time period, the four group business account was funded by an additional line of credit advances uh, to include People's Bank and a loan totaling uh, $530,000. All right, so they keep going through its money transactions. Let's see if I can get a summary here. Oh, they do a whole pie chart where they talk about his bank account. Again, this is on the um, website if you wanna look at it. Actually, it's the four groups bank account. Um, let me just see if there's a little summary here about that. No, it just goes through what they believe shows that he had financial strain one right here. Indications state police are trying to establish that Jennifer Dulos is not alive. Keep in mind, you know, Fotis Dulos is getting charged with murder and there is no body at this point. Jennifer Dulos has not been found. They have blood evidence that they have collected, but they, um, state police, in order for them to have a murder charge, need to establish and, and say that they don't believe that Jennifer Dulos is not alive. So this is what they've concluded. The following indications have been determined that Jennifer Dulos is no longer alive. 
Finances. Jennifer's mother, Gloria Farber, had been power of attorney for her daughter's finances since uh, May 19th, sorry, June 19th, 2019. Jennifer's last known financial activity was a check written by Jennifer on 523. That's the day before she went missing. The last known activity on Jennifer Dulos's checking account was 523. There has been no subsequent activity on any of her known accounts since that day. Detectives have checked with Jennifer's cellular carrier, Verizon Wireless, who has reported no activity on her cell phone since 524. Detectives have remained in regular contact with Jennifer's family and close friends, none of whom have ever heard or haven't heard from her since 524. No information has come to light in the area of medical centers that Jennifer received any in-person treatment subsequent to 524. There have been no account holder, initiated billing, or filing activity with her insurance carriers. Uh, numerous physical searches conducted by New Canaan and Farmington areas have also not turned up anything, and several media outlets have broadcast news stories outlining this case, so they're saying that we had all put it out there, so the public's highly knowledgeable about that, and they have her picture out there, and to date, the whereabouts of Jennifer Dulos is not known. So the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner on uh, August 15th of this of 2019, uh, the officer met with Dr. James Gill, who's the Chief Medical Examiner of the state, poli of state of Connecticut, rather. So Dr. Gill was presented with a summary of facts thus far, including the forensic laboratory results indicating the presence of blood in multiple locations at Jennifer's residence, which is, they believe, the crime scene. The presence of her DNA associated with those blood stains, the evidence of efforts to clean the scene, and the nature of the blood splatter analysis. So the chief medical examiner is going through everything that state police say they have. And Dr. Gill, according to the arrest warrant here, was also advised of facts associated with items of evidence recovered in Hartford, which were forensically linked back to Jennifer Dulos, which we went over earlier. We do. Okay. Dr. Gill has also provided photographs of the crime scene and evidence seized in Hartford to assist in this assessment. Following his consideration of the above facts and circumstances, Dr. Gill indicated that based upon the facts of the investigation, the degree of, the blo of blood loss, as well as other factors, he was prepared to state that Jennifer Dulos had sustained an injury or multiple injuries, which he would consider non-survivable without medical intervention. Dr. Gill categorized the event as a homicide of violence to likely include some combination of traumatic blunt force injuries such as bludgeoning slash beating and or sharp force injuries such as stabbing and slashing. So the chief medical examiner here saying the amount of blood loss and from what I can see in the evidence gathered, he doesn't think someone would be able to survive this without medical intervention. So another section here, use of zip ties. That a zip tie is a type of fastener typically constructed out of plastic with a flexible rib section, which is inserted into a receptacle in the head of the tie. Once a portion of the, so state police have to give kind of the definition of what they're saying is a zip tie. Once a portion of the rib section is drawn through the receptacle, it cannot be withdrawn. Zip ties vary in size, can be used to secure bundles of objects such as wiring, surgical applications, to compress tissue in the prevention of hemorrhages, and in law enforcement as flex cuffs to secure suspects' wrists or ankles together to prevent movement. The zip ties recovered in this case appear to be made of thick white colored plastic and were approximately 36 inches in length. Four zip ties in total were recovered. Two of the zip ties appeared stained with a blood-like substance. Given the context of this case and the totality of the circumstances in which they were recovered, it appears the zip ties were used to secure and incapacitate Jennifer Dulos for some time period, during which her blood and DNA transferred onto those ties. This would also have to do probably with the kidnapping charge that we're seeing in the first degree. As there is little reason to in incapacitate a deceased person, it is reasonable that Jennifer Dulos was alive at the time of the zip ties were attached to restrain her movements and prevent her escape. So state police believe that she was attacked, that um, she was zip tied before she uh, died. And then they go on with the charges and they explain murder. They explain felony murder and they explain kidnapping in the first degree. Okay, 35 pages. That we just went through here of Fotis Dulos's arrest warrant. We went through most of it. There was just you know some examples here or some uh, sections here that we kind of glanced over, but you know, some of the newer information 
is some of the interviews are a little bit more in depth than we saw before the actual evidence. I mean, they have, you know, a piece of plastic bag that has all three Jennifer Dulos, uh, Michelle Draconis and Fotis Dulos's DNA. They have bags that have uh, Fotis Dulos's fingerprints on them. And, um, uh, you know, the chief medical examiner going on to say that he does not believe Jennifer Dulos could have survived with the amount of blood loss and with the evidence that he saw. Does it um, do these charges? Are they going to be able to convince a jury of murder and kidnapping in addition to the other charges of, you know, hindering prosecution and tampering with evidence? That's going to be up to a jury. They have to, the, the um, prosecution is going to have to establish beyond a reasonable cause that, um, sorry, they're going to have to find beyond a reasonable doubt to convict these charges. They're going to have to convince a jury to feel comfortable enough to do that. Okay, so there's a section I want to go over on Kent Mawinney, but does anybody have any questions on Fotis Dulos that I can go over? Let me see if I can get updated here. Oh, I'm really behind, guys. I'm sorry. Okay, so um, Rose says, are they speculating that Traconis was at the crime scene with Fotis? No, state police are not saying that she was at the crime scene with Fotis. State police believe that she... Um, conspired to commit murder and tried to help him do it by possibly providing an alibi or whatever it is. Um, so Raul just asked, Jen, as a media member, were you aware law enforcement was searching at the Windsor Rod and Gun Club or was that a quiet search? Raul, that was a quiet search. We hadn't heard about the Rod and Gun Club in East Granby until this arrest warrant with Ken Mawinney. And I'm going to read you guys that section now because that's kind of, you know, interesting stuff here. Um, Kent Mawinney is the attorney for, former attorney for Fotis Dulos, represented him, him on some civil matters, including the civil suit with Gloria Farber, his mother-in-law, and he's also a close friend. So he's been charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Um, we already went through in the arrest warrant, you know, that he was at the four group that morning. He says he went over. Originally, Norm Pattis had said that Kent Mawinney was Fotis Dulos's alibi that morning. Kent Mawinney, though, kind of stating here that he never actually saw Fotis Dulos once those interviews happened. Um, okay, so I'm not gonna go through all those. Cell phone. Again, this is all new because we haven't seen any Kent Mawinney, anything about Kent Mawinney, but they do go through evidence from Fotis Dulos and the same thing with the evidence descriptions and they, they, they add all that in here even though it's for Kent Mowinney. They talk about how he's mentioned in the alibi scripts. Issues of where everyone was that morning. Okay. The phone call. The lunch. Ledge lunch. All right, we went through his phone contact. Where is this? Okay, so here's the Windsor Rod and Gun Club section. So this says that on August 7th, an officer here spoke with Jay Lawler, who is the who is a member of the Windsor Rod and Gun Club located um, on East Street. It's right next to Russell Street in the town of East Granby. This is not the Hartford Gun Club. This is a separate smaller club. It's on like 20, 25 acres of land. Uh, it's in East Granby. So this member wanted to provide information that he felt was really pertinent to this investigation. On 518, this is May 18th, 2019. This is uh, before Jennifer, days before Jennifer went missing. Um, sorry, I'm just reading something. This guy and his friend went hunting on Windsor Rod and Gun Club for his birthday. Lawler explained that the club sits on approximately 25 acres of wooded land in East Granby. The entry to the club is secured by fencing and a logging chain and only the current five members, so there's just five members of this club, are supposed to have access to this property. He goes on to say that him and his friend were walking through the woods. They came upon an area of disturbed ground. When they looked closer, they uncovered two barbecue grill grates, which had been placed over a hole that was dug into the ground. Small branches and leaves had been placed on the grill grates to hide the pit that was beneath. 
The whole dimensions were approximately two feet wide and six feet long and three feet deep. Lawler stated that he is just under six feet tall and that he would have laid down the hole. He described the hole as 100% a human grave. That is a quote. Inside of that hole, they found a blue tarp and two unopened bags of lime. Um, his friend had remarked, what's the lime for? And he had responded, for trying to rid of a body. To this, his friend responded, well, that means someone has to be missing. But the two men were unaware of any missing persons. The two men removed the grill gates, kicked around debris so the feature was obvious and that no one would fall in it. Considering the site to be spoiled, the two men went on their way. So um, he goes on to think about who had dug that hole and for what purpose. So this is kind of sticking with this gun club member. He's, he's, it's not sitting right with him. He then lean, learned that around 522, so this is just two days before Jennifer went missing, um, someone had been on the club property and had checked that hole. He discovered it was half filled with water due to heavy rain and that the bags of lime had been removed. So someone had gone back and removed the stuff in it. Again, he considered this curious as no one was missing yet. He shrugged it off. In early June, he went out to the property and found a hole had been filled, had found the hole had been filled and covered uh, as neat as a pin with leaves and sticks to the point where you could not tell that a hole had ever even been there. Towards the end of June, he was talking with a friend who was a police officer in Agawam, Massachusetts. And when he heard about the hole, he told, um, he told this guy that we need to report what we knew to police. Cause again, it wasn't sitting right. On or about 621, um, so this is after, um, you know, almost a month after Jennifer went missing, he went over to an East Granby resident trooper office and spoke with a trooper. After telling them what they knew, the trooper went with them to the hole to excavate it. After only digging down approximately 1.5 feet, efforts were halted because it was hot weather and nothing was found there. Uh, on August 2nd, um, the member, the gun club member Lawler was installing an outbuilding on the property when one of the other club members remarked, did you hear about Kent Mowinney? He's involved in that Dulos case. It was at this point that Lawler came to several realizations. Mowinney was an associate of Dulos whose wife had gone missing on 524. Mowinney was responsible for the club's existence. He had found the land and helped to secure it and establish the club 12 to 15 years earlier. Although he had left the club approximately five to six years earlier, Mawinney had reached out to another club member in March or April of 2019 before Jennifer went missing. He had said he wanted to get back into the club and had inquired about how to get back on the property. The member told Mawinney about the hidden key to the logging chain. Mawinney had taken the information and had never followed up by renewing his club membership. <clears throat> The gun club member then went back to the East Granby tr resident trooper and spoke with the trooper again who passed along the information uh, to state police. So then on August 14th, and this is what you were just talking about, Raul, um, August 14th, state police and members of the New Canaan Police Department and Connecticut State Police canine search and rescue teams responded to the Windsor Rod and Gun Club under the authority of written consent to search, which was signed by Mr. Lawler. So he's saying, yes, come search, sign, you know, he signed it away. Detectives searched the property for signs of a hole. At GPS coordinates, and it gives like the latitude and longitude, uh, teams found a site of disturbed earth measuring approximately two and a half feet wide, six feet long, three and a half feet deep, which is exactly how they described it. Surface debris, leaves, twigs, fabric from a nearby hunting line was found well underground. So they're saying that the earth had been disturbed. The canine team searched the hole and surrounding property, but they could not locate any human remains. No sign of the tarp or the bags of lime were located. The hole was photographed and then filled back in. Um, now, they go to Mawinney's phone records and they decide to look at that. Detectives obtained a search warrant. They were able uh, to check the range of his cell phone from February 1st to September 13th. So in between, obviously, Jennifer went missing. A review of the records revealed the following. On March 29th, 2019, from 1 p.m. until 1.43 p.m., Mawinney's cell phone polled the tower in East Granby, which appears to service the site of the Windsor Rod and Gun Club. 
Mawini's cell phone pulled the cell phone tower, which appears to serve as Dulos's residence on 523 at 521 and 523 p.m. So his cell phone's pinging the night before Jennifer went missing, apparently near Dulos's house, although he says that he had no phone contact with him. These times coincide with the time at which Dulos left his dinner party guests on the night before Jennifer's disappearance to drive to Stop and Shop in Simsbury because he needed more meat to cook. Prior to his device traveling to the area of Stop and Shop, Dulos's device traveled to the area of 80 Mountain Spring Road. Residential surveillance confirmed Dulos drove onto the property of 8 Mountain Spring Road, remaining there for approximately seven minutes. On 524, this is the day Jennifer went missing, 729 a.m. until 822 a.m. Uh, this is consistent with Mawini being present at the four group office on the morning of his crime, as confirmed by Traconis and Mawini himself. So his, his phone is pinging there that morning, and they're there. Uh, and Mawini and Traconis had said that they were there. 531, after Jennifer Dulos goes missing, disappears. Mawini's cell phone pulled the tower again in East Granby, which appears to service the site of the Windsor Rod and Gun Club. So twice his cell phone in that time period is pinging near the um, gun club. All right. So, you know, I think that his attorney, of course, is going to sit here and say, well, a cell phone pinging in the area doesn't mean that he went and he dug the hole. That's what his attorney is probably going to argue. Again, this is going to be up to a jury unless he pleads out. So we'll have to see about that. Um, other than that, they go through the conspiracy to commit murder charges with Kent Mawinney. Michelle Traconis' conspiracy to commit murder as well. Uh, most of the information that's in her arrest warrant is also in Fotis Dulos's, which we went over already. So, um, if you guys have any questions, I know we went for a long haul here, um, but you're welcome to ask them. Again, um, these three do not have court hearings tomorrow. If anyone is able to bond out, though, they will appear in um, Stanford Superior Court. And we aren't sure if that's going to happen or not, although Michelle Traconis' lawyer says she will be able to bond out. Fotis Dulos' lawyers say he they believe he'll be able to bond out. Uh, Mo Winnie's, we don't know at this point. So Frankie says it doesn't appear to service the area. It does service it. Yeah, Frankie, I'm just reading directly off of what state police say in the warrant. Let me just double check on that. Who pays for Fotis's bond, Todd wants to know? Good question. Because it's a high one. Let's see here. No, I mean, state police are saying appears to service. That's the, the wording they use. I don't know exactly why they're using that wording, but that's what I'm just reading off of this. <clears throat> All right. Mm -hmm. So Rose has a really good question. Is there evidence they have not disclosed yet that we don't know about? I asked Jim Bergen, this the attorney in Hartford, because um, I said, like, you know, is there some kind of bombshell piece of evidence that could come out that we don't know about? And he said, he, according to, for his opinion, he's a criminal defense attorney, most likely not. He said that usually, um, you know, state police and prosecutors will put everything, or state police, sorry, in this case, state police, eventually prosecutors, state police will put everything they've got in these arrest warrants um, just to get a solid case. That being said, you know, they could be holding something. That doesn't mean it, something can't come up during the trial that they all of a sudden want to bring in. For example, state police seized, according to um, Norm Pattis, Fotis's attorney, an axe today, or yesterday from his garage. That axe is now going to go to the crime lab for DNA testing and analysis. So if they found something on there, well, that's going to get submitted, right? So that's going to be new evidence. So who knows if they decide to hold something, it, it is possible. The deal is though, that they have to be able to give it over in discovery. They can't just show up at the trial and do it because they have to give the defense a chance to be able to defend and know about whatever evidence they have. So um, it's a great question. I'm still very curious about it too. Um, we'll have to see. That's kind of an unknown right now. 
Let's see here. Sorry, I'm just reading some of these. Um, tutu. Uh, yeah, Todd, the ax is gonna be, they're gonna, they'd seized it as evidence, so it's gonna be analyzed. It is going to be tested. Janet wants to know, is Michelle being held at Niantic? which is the women's prison. How, Michelle would still be at Niantic, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so yeah. We're, we're pretty sure. York Correctional Institute is um, the all women's prison and uh, since she didn't post bond, we're pretty sure that she got brought back there. We know she was there last night. It would make sense if she was brought back there again. Let's see here. Uh, so Mandy was asking, someone else was saying, didn't Traconis's bail get reduced to 1.5 million today? Yes, it was originally 2 million. It got reduced to 1.5 million, still not as low as they had wanted it. Her lawyers were trying to get it for about half a million. Um, you got it, Rose. Mm hmm Okay, Sylvia's, yeah, only women's prison, yep. So Darren asks, uh, do you think they will give him life or death? I mean, we don't know at this point. He still needs to be convicted of these charges. It's important to note, though, that Connecticut does not have the death penalty anymore. We used to have the death penalty. It got overturned several years ago. So uh, punishment here in Connecticut would be life in prison. Okay, so I want to end this because uh, I do want to bring this up too. I know we talked about Carrie Luft, who has the uh, who, who's the family spokesperson for Jennifer Dulos. They had sent us a statement um, after these three charges, these three new charges. So I'm just going to read it real quick. Um, Carrie Luft sent us a statement that was released. Sorry, she's a close friend of Jennifer Farber Dulos. Above all, we want to thank Connecticut State Police and the New Canaan Police Department, as well as the assisting local departments for their tireless commitment and diligent, painstaking work that have led to these arrests. Although we are relieved that the wait for these charges is over, for us there is no sense of closure. Nothing can bring Jennifer back. We miss her every day and will forever mourn her loss. We believe the arrest warrants will speak for themselves, and we ask that you respect our privacy during this time. Thank you. Okay, so that's Carrie Left, who is the spokesperson for uh, Jennifer Dulos' friends and family. Um, guys, we're going to have a full wrap-up of everything that happened today at 10 o'clock tonight. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming with your questions and for you know, patiently uh, going through this arrest warrant. Again, if you want any of the, to want to view the arrest warrant, these are public documents. You can do them on our website, uh, fox61.com. They're all there for you to read. Appreciate it, and uh, have a good night.